Hello, my name is Nicholas Horton from Amherst College and the ECOTS 2020 Program Committee. Welcome back. I'm so pleased that we have Annalise, Rebecca, and Bev today. Um, just a quick introductions and bios for them. Annalise Sabag is an assistant professor of statistic at Cal uh, Polytechnic State University. She conducts research on assessment of students' statistical knowledge and research on students' interactions in online courses. Rebecca Wong is a mathematics instructor at West Valley College. She is currently chair of the ASA AMATIC Statistics Committee and just kind of dealing with the alphabet soup there, ASA, American Statistical Association. AMATIC is the American Mathematical Association of two-year colleges. She's, Rebecca is also co-author of Introductory Statistics, Exploring the World Through Data with Gould and Ryan. Last but not least, uh, Bev Wood has been teaching statistics for 15 years as an adjunct doctoral student and assistant professor, but always in a mathematics department. In recent years, she's been teaching almost exclusively online. Without any further ado, they're here to talk to us about engaging diverse learners online. Always timely, always important. I look forward to hearing the discussion. Thank you, Nick. Um, so I've, I've put uh, some stats here um, on, on the screen to talk about what sort of diversity I'm faced with. Um, uh, seeing all those continents listed there, you, you might wonder, we do indeed teach all of our courses in English, although it's, it's clear that they're not all uh, native speakers. And that 11% that we use uh, some sort of synchronous uh, component, uh, there are uh, almost all of them have the uh, kind of a hybrid thing where we do meet in, at a particular time and place, sometimes virtually, uh, but, but we also do things uh, through our LMS, which is Canvas. So I think that, you know, if I can do this uh, with all this kind of crazy diversity that uh, I thought was insane when I took the job, um, I think you can too. So Annalise? Would you change this thing? Uh, so this is our uh, the first question, the one that I'm going to give some ideas um, how to answer, and um, then Rebecca and Elise will will take other ones. So my first point is going to be in this uh, student to student environment. How do you get students to talk to one another uh, when when they're not sitting next to one another in a classroom? And uh, you know we have all of our courses have a similar template in how they're put together and, and they all have an introduction discussion and um, you know some boring stuff like what's your major all that kind of stuff and, and I've, I've switched it up and added some of these things that I'm calling odd questions and uh, I don't think it's odd at all but because I, I it's like a I must have it in order to do the other thing that's at the top of the other column this instructor presence thing is I need to know where they are so what time zone are they in? So when they turn in something late, I know it's because they looked at the clock wrong or, you know, that kind of thing. Um, but what I love about that question is uh, that a lot of students then talk about where, in fact, they're actually located. I only care about the time zone for the reasons I just mentioned, uh, but they say where they're located. And we have such a high percentage of military students that they'll tell me what base they're on or something like that. And then they begin to talk to one another about, oh, I was there and, and do you, were you in this squadron or that, you know, that kind of stuff. So I think it's a really great opening uh, point uh, for them to know each other some more. I also ask how they want to be called because Canvas, you know, puts the name that's in the um, enrollment management stuff and um, that might not be what they want to call. And so I make a, a spreadsheet with both of these pieces of information and use use their actual names that they want to be called in the discussions the rest of the semester. And again, that's toward that instructor presence that Rebecca is going to talk some more about. Um, we have both whole class and uh, small group discussions. Um, the applications are often in this whole class environment, uh, kind of forcing everybody to talk, which uh, is, is helpful for some students who are generally shy, make them talk. And then the small group, uh, we talk about some concept sort of things. And again, the, the anonymity, asynchronousness of it does uh, pull in some of those students who would normally not even 
uh, say a thing in a in a classroom some peer review of projects so before I look at them they each look at them which helps with some of the grammar and punctuation problems not to mention occasional computational things we have just launched so I don't have anything more to say about it but it's an, an e-union so um, uh, it, a Facebook thing sort of for just us a social media sort of deal a virtual community and um, we have uh, groups set up for classes so it's not just my students taking introductory statistics but all the students taking introductory statistics the other side of the column I mentioned the instructor presence the synchronous and asynchronous office hours is turning out to be uh, you know I don't get as I get fewer visitors than I than I did when I was teaching in a, a, on an actual campus, um, but I think that there's a value in knowing that it's available. Uh, again, with the instructor presence idea, and of course, when somebody's freaking out over an assignment um, and they do show up, they're all very timid and whatnot. And by the time they uh, leave me, uh, they're you know think I'm their best friend. So the synchronous piece. Um, we off have uh, Zoom for our meeting and uh, we have a, a discussion online and so other students sometimes answer those questions before I even see them. Um, I, I've mentioned the using of the names. Um, I ask lots of questions and point to supplemental resources, which I keep in a file because I know I'm going to use it and there's always somebody who posts something that's uh, you know, appropriate. I use video for announcements, lectures, feedback. Um, again, I keep those some of that banked uh, so that I don't have to come up with them every term. Um, but obviously, you know that students ask the same kinds of questions every every term. And I make sure that I respond to messages really quick, which again is has something to do with um, rapid. Uh, I mean, with instructor presence, which is what Rebecca is going to talk about. So thanks, Beverly. Um, so I teach at West Valley College, which is a community college in California. Um, if you're not familiar with the California community college system, we're 115 colleges and really designed with open access. The intent was to design a system that gave access to higher education to literally everyone. And so um, in a California community college, you're going to encounter just about every kind of diversity you can think of. Um, gender, ethnicity, economic, mathematical background, educational background, age, you name it, uh, that's who we serve. Annalise, next slide, please. So the question I'm going to be addressing is, how do you humanize instruction in online classes to meet the needs of a diverse student group? Annalise? So um, what does it mean to humanize online instruction? Um, basically, in a nutshell, it means to convey your human presence, um, your empathy and awareness of your students' needs with intentionality. Um, so students begin to see more as just than just the content expert, but also someone who really is there to support their learning and is interested them, in them as people. Um, and this research shows that if we do this, if we humanize our instruction with intentionality, it leads to increased student motivation and engagement, which of course we know will lead to improved student success as well. Annalise? An easy way to start doing this is just to post an instructor video, meet your instructor video on your online campus uh, online site. I'm not gonna play this, but um, you, if you watch it later, you can see this is just me in my office doing a 360 with my phone. Um, but I think when students see me in my office or see what my office looks like, they get a really good idea of my personality and what's important to me. And hopefully they um, see me as someone who's excited about teaching and someone who um, really is there to support them in their learning. Next slide. Two basic ways to humanize um, your course um, would be in your course design and in making sure that you design also not only your instruction, but also your um, opportunities for students to get to know each other as a community of learners. <clears throat> um, so one way you can humanize your course design is by allowing your students to have some personal choice so that they can put their personal stamp on their learning and to really um, apply their learning to things that they're passionate about. 
In my class, um, our opening unit, our first small project, I have them explore a data set of their own choosing and then do a short presentation about a question that they explored using that data set. And this semester, um, here are just some examples. I had a student whose family was from Pakistan. And so she found a data set on drone strikes in Pakistan and did her um, project on that. I had a student who was very upset that the VTA was cutting bus service to his neighborhood. So he went online and found VTA data on ridership <clears throat> and did his project on that. I had a student who was very interested in gambling and he found some open data on slot machine payouts at two casinos and he did his project on that. So you see a wide variety of student interests uh, displayed in that project. The artwork on this slide is what um, one of my students did to help illustrate his project. So you can see it's very personalized and really shows what my students are passionate about. Um, Bev already gave us some really good ideas about fostering student connections, and Annalise is going to talk about that as well. Um, I've included a link here on um, a, a, something that a colleague of mine shared with me from the online teaching conference about a structure called Interacts. And I personally haven't used it, but I'm definitely going to give it a try in fall. Um, so I, I included that in case you wanted to check it out. <clears throat> but the idea behind this is that you want your students not only to see you as an empathetic person who's interested in their success, but also to see themselves as a community of learners with classmates who are also interested in their success and interested in each other's success as well. Annalise, next slide. <clears throat> Another thing I would encourage you to think about is the language of your syllabus. This is true. Students cannot learn if they're fearful or anxious. And so when thinking about your syllabus language, if you were to read it over, does your syllabus make your students feel welcome in a classroom where they're going to be cared for? When you read your syllabus, do students have the ability to feel validated and have a sense that you know that they will be successful? And does your syllabus give any um, sense that there's a partnership where you'll be working together to ensure success? And there's lots of um, uh, resources on how to write a more equitable syllabus that I've included in a slide in case you're interested in learning more about it. Annalise, next slide. But this is a story that was shared about a student's experience and in a class that had very strict language in the syllabus about cell phone policy, which I'm sure many of us do. But this student missed a call from their students, from their child's school, saying that their child was being rushed to the hospital. And I can only imagine as an instructor how I would have felt had this been a student in my class. And I think this comment is really telling. Um, I wish it went without saying that the syllabi should not be instruments of abuse. Uh, Annalise, next slide. So does all of this really make a difference? Does it really make a difference to humanize your instruction? Um, so this is something that a colleague shared with me from the end of the year survey that she does with her students. And this last comment just really caught my eye. She was talking about her instructor and how she experienced with her instructor. She made me feel welcomed and I didn't realize how much a professor can change your perspective on a course so much. Annalise, last slide. So um, I hope many of you were able to hear Roxy Peck's wonderful keynote address at the start of ECOTS. And one of the things she talked about was um, when she would give workshops on engaging students and making learning active, you know, she would get a little question about, well, is it really my job to make learning fun? Is it really my job to entertain my students? And what Roxy said and what she reminded us is our job is to facilitate student learning. And if we know that students can't learn when they're feeling anxious or fearful or stressed, then we can facilitate their learning by humanizing our courses so that they don't feel that. And so that, that, that is that stress and that anxiety they feel about being your, in your statistics class, especially your online class is, is decreased. I was just talking with my students a couple of days ago, we were wrapping up this very unusual semester and one of my students said this, which just really struck me. She said, you care about us as people and not just about our output. And I think 
most of us care about our students. I mean, we wouldn't be in education if we didn't. Um, educators, I know, are, are empathetic people. We care about our students. We spend, we go to conferences or we talk nothing about how can we help our students be more successful. And yet I can see how students get this false impression of us if all we do is comment on their work. And so I think it's important that we, with intentionality, through how we structure our courses, with how we structure our student to student interaction and their interaction with us, humanize our course so they really do know how passionate we are about their success. Annalise, last slide. So I did include some resources in case you want to explore any of these ideas further. And now I'm going to turn it over to Annalise. All right, here we go. So my name is Annalise. I teach statistics at Cal Poly. And I'm here to talk to you uh, about one of the courses that I teach is an intro stats course for social science students. And we're still in the quarter system here. And I don't see as much variety as my two colleagues were just talking about. Um, but of course, there is still plenty of variety in my classroom. So what I would like to talk about with you is how can we use our assignments in our course to actually engage a diverse group of students, but now in an online setting that we are all kindly forced to be in this quarter. So one of the goals that I have in my classroom is uh, I want students to participate and I want all of them to participate. I don't want to just have like three, four students that are usually asking and answering questions, but I want everyone to be with me. I also don't want them to just sit and listen to me. I want them to engage with me, engage with their group members, right? With their students around them. So students are helping each other and they're learning together. So this is some of the goals that I have in my course. And I was able to do this through the use of collaborative keys. Uh, Laura Lay was the one who gave me this idea and I'm very thankful for talking to her before I started teaching online. She talked about collaborative keys yesterday in, the, in her presentation. Uh, it was the COVID section. But collaborative keys are just Google Doc files that you populate with questions and then you have some sort of structure that you want your students to follow for them to answer those questions. The first time I taught, I just followed the same format that Laura Lay did in her biostats course at the U of M. So I have one collaborative key for the whole class. So uh, students have an activity that they need to complete every week, right? So I just take the questions from that activity and I put those in the collaborative key. And then what I want is students to go in and then help to create the answer key to that activity. So there is some sort of interactions that I'm hoping that I will see is students going in and posting, posting an answer to one of the questions by a certain deadline. After the deadline, I will go in, I'll give some feedback, and then I'm hoping that students will come back in, look at my feedback, provide a second contribution. It can be just answering a question that I asked them, it could be providing another answer or asking another question. So uh, there's a lot of flexibility. If I set up the collaborative key like this, then I just grade them based on completion. So if students are making their first and second contributions and I just say, yes, I agree, then they get the points. So this is how I set it up. And I did see a little bit of like student to professor interactions, which was great, but I saw almost none of student to student interaction. And that's what I was really looking forward to seeing. Um, and Lorelei yesterday in her presentation, she mentioned that there are some students that are eager to fill out the collaborative key even more than one question. And I would tell you that didn't happen in my class, not at all. My students were barely making to the second contribution. And I figure out is that my students are undergraduate students, right? And I am in a service course too. And Lorelei is dealing with graduate students, which have much more interest in the class that they are taking. So, you know, again, I saw wonderful things. You know, I saw students uh, post posting answers, other students coming and then providing different types of answers. I had to figure out how to give written feedback. I'm like, maybe the best thing is not for me to come and say, hey, your answer is not correct. You know, but even when I changed the way I gave feedback, um, I was still just seeing like some students coming up and popping up and giving an answer, but not really seeing much interaction among the students. So what I've decided to do is I'm like, how can I change this? Collaborative key is awesome, but it's just I need to help students to interact a little bit more. So I talked with Beth Chance and Beth has awesome ideas. And what we thought is maybe we can add a little bit of a cooperative structure to the collaborative keys. You now, so there is still this individual accountabilities where students need to go in, 
they need to provide their answers. But now they're working in groups. So they're going to see a couple different answers for the same question. And then students also have other group roles, right? Because again, we want all of them to participate. We want all of them to be engaged. It doesn't matter if they, if they are afraid of statistic, if they had a bad pass with math. Like, no, they are all supposed to be participating here. So there is group roles and there is also a shared goal, right? So these are all elements of cooperative learning theory. So the way that the uh, assignment is now structured, it does encourage students to work in groups to talk with each other, right? In a way that they won't be able to get to a final group answer if they are not working together, right? So it's beneficial for them to work together. So this is the changes that I make to the collaborative key. Now I have one collaborative key per group and now for the whole class. Students are working in groups of two and three. And now um, if my activity usually have about 35 questions, I take about five or six or seven of those questions and I put those in the collaborative key. Um, and now what I've changed is I want students to give their initial answer. Then I want to have some sort of discussion. I want them to read each other's answers and figure out like, are we on the same track? Uh, or is, is their answer that is a little bit different? So I want them to discuss their answers so that at the end, they can come up with a final group answer. So when I did it this way, then I was able to grade on correctness, which I think is also something huge when you are in an undergraduate course and a service course too. So I saw when I set it up this way, then I was able to see what I was really looking forward to was to see a lot of student to students interaction. So a lot of students helping each other to get to their final goal of a group answer. One thing also that I noticed is sometimes students were struggling a little bit in the discussion part because this is all done asynchronous, right? So I make the collaborative key available, students make a copy of it, and then they work with their partner until a certain due date, which is usually like Wednesday. Um, and then there is no way for me to go in and try to help them. So what I did is I created wrap up videos. So wrap up videos are videos that I make available after students completed the, their initial answers. And I just talk about the most important parts of that activity, uh, common mistakes that I've seen maybe in the previous quarter, and I give some kind of tips, and maybe even talk about some of the questions that they will see in the collaborative key. So with this student to student interaction and them helping each other, plus this additional resource, then I saw awesome things like I'm going to show you now. This is an example of a question that was asking students to compute the p-value and show their work. So in this example, you can see one of the students did a one-sided task, the other student did a two-sided task. So the answers here are different, right? So uh, in addition, you can see that they used uh, different values for their statistic. So these were their initial answers. When we got to the discussion part, you see the student reflecting about their own answer after they saw a different answer. So that first student was saying, you know what? I was not sure if it was a one-sided or two-sided task. I ended up doing a two-sided task. Maybe this was wrong. And then you see the other student coming in and saying, yeah, in addition, maybe you used the wrong statistic. And I'm like, this is awesome. You see a student reflecting about the answer. You see another student coming and helping. And technically, I don't even need to be here, right? They are doing this, you know? And of course, the video wrap up kind of gives a little bit more help to them. And then at the end, they have their final group answer. And here is uh, what I really grade. So I look at their final group answer and I grade this based on correctness. But of course, I still read their initial answers and their discussion. In the beginning of the quarter, it's very important for you to look very carefully because a lot of times students will not provide much discussion. So you need to like encourage them. And I take points. If they don't discuss their answers, I take points. Sometimes you're going to see a little bit weird things like students with very similar answers. You know, and sometimes a student might not get too much out of the um, group interaction. Here, our students were saying, you know, make sure you use the MAD to calculate the, stat the, the to interpret the p-value in this case. And then a student was a little bit off, but then he said, I watched the wrap-up videos and this really helped. You know, so this is just a couple of examples um, of how I set up the collaborative key. So I changed it a little bit to kind of set up an undergraduate course. And you can do anything you want really here. So it's, it's very easy and very straightforward. Just make sure you have clear guidance for your students. So these were the questions that we tried to answer uh, in this 30-minute uh, panel. So um, if you have any questions for us, please let us know. And we're just looking forward to answering them. Great. Well, I want to thank you all for a really interesting and engaging uh, following the 
theme of the conference presentation. Um, Bev, you already answered some of this a little bit in the um, chat window, but could you talk a little bit more about what's worked or maybe what's worked not so well for your asynchronous office hours? Um, so, you know, a, a lot of my students are, are hesitant to ask questions. Um, I mean, they're taking an online course and, and they're probably a bit surprised that they have to talk to their neighbor um, in any fashion. Um, so I, I do still get a questions um, through Canvas messaging. Um, but that's the idea is that if they would ask those sorts of questions in the discussion board that's labeled office hours, um, it would be possible, um, like I said, this is all exacerbated by the fact we're in separate time zones. So I'm shutting down my computer at seven or eight o'clock at night and they're just waking up. And so they might post a, a question uh, early in the morning that I don't see until, you know, 18 hours later or something. So that's that's kind of the, the purpose of it though is is to put it out there and you know if the professor gets to it first that's great you know or we know for a fact we have a correct answer if the professor types it there but um they can answer each other's questions too and, and we have a second one that's called a student um oh it's got a fancy name but anyway it's a, it's a discussion forum so they could talk to one another and um sometimes the students use them you know interchangeably and that's okay i i I don't promise to answer things in the student lounge, the student lounge, um, but uh, I, I do check and make sure that somebody answered a question with correct answer in that place. Great. It's well, often a technical question about how do I upload this thing or something. Um, thanks. Rebecca, there's a question. Uh, can you talk really briefly about how to monitor the group dynamic particularly in asynchronous interactions. The, the question writer wants to make sure um, that when they do this, that the interactions support a positive, inclusive environment from all students, but they, they say that, you know, they're not sure exactly how to do that. Um, like I said, I haven't tried the interacts yet, but if you go into that, the file, you'll see that um, the types of interactions that you structure you know, starting off with very basic, easy kinds of interactions um, that will be helpful. I think Annalise might be able to talk a little bit more about that because she uses a cooperative learning structure, which really makes sure that you have roles followed. If you're interested um, in this topic, Luke Woods did a wonderful um, webinar on microaggressions in online discussions uh, and how to monitor that. And you might look for um, his work. I, I'll try to put it in the chat. Great. Annalisa, there's a couple of questions uh, for you that are related. Uh, one is kind of the size of your class. Yeah, so uh, I currently have 35 students in my classroom. This quarter, because all my sections are online, I'm dealing with about uh, 50 or a little bit more. You know, so one thing I really do think that in terms of, you know, if you're in a huge classroom, it might be trickier to do this. Um, and maybe you need a TA to help you figure out how to grade the collaborative keys. But if you're working with groups of three, which I think it's the best number to work with, then again, you won't have to grade, you know, a hundred students homework. You just, you know, they're in groups of three. So I think that can be helpful. Of course, having a TA is also very helpful. Um, there was another question here, and I think someone was um, asking about the grade in the club. Oh, Elena was asking about the grade in the collaborative keys. So the grade is a little bit different. They get a grade for submitting the answers because, um, as I said, they do it individually first, right? So if they submit the answers, they get a certain amount of points. And then in the collaborative keys, there is a certain other amount of points. And then at the end, there is a participation survey that students do. So I ask them to tell me, like, did your group members participate or did you have to carry them on the back? Usually I don't have many issues because you see students' names and what they are posting, but then another percentage of the points is participation. And if one of the students is not participating, he doesn't, or she or he, whatever, doesn't get the points for the collaborative key. You know, so the points is where you can kind of make this really, really work. Great. Well, unfortunately we've come out of time. There's a flood of questions on the, um, on the menu. And we do have the opportunity to continue some of these conversations tomorrow on the hot topics. I've posted on the chat window 
the link to the Thursday Hot Topic Questionnaire. If you have questions, if you have thoughts, go ahead and add those in there, as that allows us to kind of bring together some of the speakers and other things to tie together some of the many, many kind of points we've heard from ECOTS. I want to thank Annalisa and Bev and Rebecca for a really interesting and provocative uh, and informative presentation. I know we're all looking forward to the um, slides being posted with the links because there's lots of parts in there that uh, I think is very interesting.